One of the very first things that Edie told me was that she only had a few more years to live. That was more than eight years ago in 2009. And she wasn't kidding. After her spouse, the Aspire, passed away, Edie had suffered from a series of heart attacks which were diagnosed by the doctors as broken heart syndrome, which is a real thing. Indeed, Edie asked me and some of the other lawyers on our team to carry her nitroglycerin tablets with her, with us, when we intended events, just in case. Because of her heart condition, I think it's fair to say I became pretty completely neurotic <laughs> about making sure that Edie's case got decided as quickly as possible. I felt like any time that we managed to shave off, however slight, might be the margin of error between Edie living to see a victory in her case or not. Looking back on this today, I have to admit that the strategy I chose to try to accomplish this goal was somewhat unconventional. Less than two weeks after we filed the complaint that became United States v. Windsor, I wrote the district court judge, Barbara Jones, a letter stating as follows. Given Edie's coronary disease, she seeks to pursue this action as expeditiously as possible. And then I sent Judge Jones another letter. This time, I informed the court that Edie was suffering from an allergic reaction. And once again, I asked Judge Jones to expedite the case in any way possible. And then I sent another letter, <laughs> and another, and then one more. Believe it or not, over the next year and a half, I would write a dozen letters like this to the court, each time begging Judge Jones to speed up the process. My co-counsel and the eminent constitutional scholar, Pam Carlin, aptly characterized them as my Edie has the sniffles letters. <laughs> <laughs> Although I knew that there was a risk that we might be annoying the judge, I kept sending them anyway. As our son Jacob says when we catch him eating chocolate first thing in the morning, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> Judge Jones has since retired from the bench, and I have had the chance to ask her what she really thought at the time about my letters. She said that she thought I was full of it. <laughs> but she also said that she never once held it against Edie or our case. But the truth is, despite all my letters to the court, I never really thought that Edie would ever die. There are certain people on this planet, and Edie was surely one of them, who seem to have an inner light that is stronger and shines brighter than the rest of us. And it's impossible even now to imagine that light ever dimming. The fact that Edie was the perfect plaintiff was obvious to me from the very first time we met. She was passionate and she was devoted to her late, then late spouse, first spouse, the Aspire. She was brilliant and articulate. She was beautiful. But even though I believed that Edie was the ideal person to tell the story of why Doma was so fundamentally unfair, we actually pushed her hard at the beginning in order to make sure that she actually knew what she was getting into. We discussed with her the risks she might encounter and pushed her on whether she really wanted to subject herself to criticism, some even from within our own community, with a heart condition in her 80s. But Edie never hesitated. To her, fighting for equality was a tribute to Thea and to their love for each other, as well as to the entire LGBT community. As a lawyer, there are moments with the client when you hold your breath. Perhaps none of those is scarier than when your client speaks at a press conference for the very first time while a case is pending, which Edie did the day we filed our complaint. But from the moment she opened her mouth, that four foot 11, 95 pound Jewish lady with perfectly manicured nails and perfectly bobbed hair explained with such clarity why her rights and all of our rights should not be denied. Edie was immediately a cultural icon, which meant that there were not many more moments where I had to hold my breath and to worry about what Edie would have to say. I wanted Edie to be herself, perhaps, as you heard Rabbi Kleinbaum mention, with one very significant exception. 
Edie was never shy about describing the two maxims that she and Thea lived by. The first was don't postpone joy. The second was keep it hot. <laughs> well, I had no issue at all with don't postpone joy. <laughs> and indeed, you've heard how Edie indeed did not postpone joy throughout her entire life till the very end. Keeping it hot was a different story especially since it was not uncommon for someone to ask Edie to elaborate in detail <laughs> about how she and Thea actually kept it hot. I cannot remember the details, maybe I've blocked them out, <laughs> but suffice it to say, her answers to those questions made me just a teeny bit uncomfortable. And given that we are filing a case that had the potential to go all the way to the Supreme Court, I didn't want any of the justices thinking about Edie's sex life no matter how hot it was. <laughs> so here's the full part of the story. So when I asked Edie to promise me that she wouldn't talk publicly about sex, she made it very clear that she did not agree with my strategy. <laughs> she reluctantly agreed to do it, but in order to seal the deal, I had to promise her that all bets were off the minute the case was over. We won the Windsor case at 10.03 in the morning on June 26, 2013. Edie was talking about sex before noon. <laughs> There's a bit more to this story. After the Supreme Court ruled on our case, Justice Sotomayor met Edie's cousin Lewis, who you've heard from, who Edie adored along with his wife and his two children. Justice Sotomayor told e. Lewis that the no talking about sex rule was very wise and that Edie was right to follow the advice of her lawyer. But it gets even better. It turns out that upon hearing that story from Lewis, Edie told him that she still didn't agree with my advice. <laughs> This, of course, was classic Edie. Not only did her light shine brightly, but she had a will of steel. In fact, I don't think she would have changed her mind even if all eight other justices had told her that I was right. <laughs> Representing Edie in court was a great honor, but so was having her become a member of our family. Although our now 11-year-old son Jacob reads the New York Times front page, he has dyslexia. As a result, Jacob had to work very, very hard to learn how to read. Before he could do so on his own, Edie would come over to our apartment and read to him for hours at a time, including all the books in the Captain Underpants series, <laughs> which are just what they sound like, about a superhero who wears briefs and a cape and fights talking toilets. <laughs> of course, Edie's love was not unrequited. Jacob adored Edie right back. Edie once explained this in her own words, as she said, it is often said that as gay people, we get to choose our own families. Those words could not be truer for me. Not a single day goes by when I don't think about my parents or about Thea, then the love of my life. And while no one could ever replace them in my heart, I have also fallen in love with Robbie's family, most especially her son Jacob. The entire legal team who represented Edie at the Supreme Court and all the way through, including the lawyers at the ACLU, and I see James Essex here, the Stanford, <laughs> the lawyers who worked with Pam at the Stanford Supreme Court Clinic, and, at Paul, and the lawyers on my team at Paul Weiss, we all became, in a way, part of a very large and very extended family. Two nights before my argument at the Supreme Court, we celebrated Passover together by holding a 64-person Seder, that's gotta be a record even for anyone in this room, in a conference room at the Mandarin Oriental, Oriental Hotel in Washington, D.C. My wife, Rachel, organized the Seder, and one of her greatest worries was making sure that they soup, served soup with matzo balls in it instead of wontons. <laughs> Reading together from Rachel's feminist Haggadah, we told the story of Moses leading the Jewish people from bondage in Egypt to freedom. It may sound crazy, but I have long believed that the timing of when we read certain passages in the Torah is not pure coincidence. In fact, I just gave you an example of that. 
Passover in 2013 started two days before my argument at the Supreme Court. This week's Torah portion is Vayelach, which is Deuteronomy 31, which tells the story of the last day of Moses' life before he dies at the age of 120. As I'm sure you know, although Moses was undoubtedly the single greatest prophet in the Jewish tradition, God denied him the opportunity to enter the promised land before he died. As Moses says to the Israelites who are gathered on the banks of the Jordan, today I am 120 years old. I can no longer go or come since the Lord said to me, you shall not cross this river Jordan. Be strong and courageous, neither fear nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. God will neither fail you nor forsake you. I actually find this to be one of the most heartbreaking passages in the Torah. Even Moses, who managed to liberate the Jews from Pharaoh, lead them to Israel, and forge them into a free people, even he couldn't enter the promised land? Really? In order to make myself feel better, I like to think that this story is a way of saying that no human being ever gets to complete the work of liberation. In other words, if we die with a sense that our work is complete, then we have not aimed high enough. Edie saw in her lifetime the seemingly impossible dream of marriage that she and Thea shared when they first got engaged back in 1967 become reality for gay and lesbian couples across the nation and now even across the world. In fact, Edie had a huge role, as we all know, in making that happen. And Edie rightfully exercised that right again with the utmost joy and passion when she married her beloved spouse, spouse Judith, last year. But although she lived to be 88, Many years past the point any of her doctors expected, Edie has now left it to others, to us, to take the next steps to repair the world. Edie did not see her work as finished after United States v. Windsor, and neither should we. I believe that the best way to honor Edie's memory is to redouble our efforts to resist any undoing of the progress that we have made. Like Edie, we need to be strong and courageous, and we need to keep fighting to make sure that we continue the work started by Edie and by so many others, from generation to generation, or la dor va dor, until the true promise of our great nation and our Constitution becomes a reality.